I'm reading just one verse of scripture this morning, and it's from John, the 19th chapter, verse 25, from the New International Version. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Madeline. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. And on this Mother's Day, I want to speak from the subject of the gift of mothers. The gift of mothers. It is a tragedy as if the scene at the cross and at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ wasn't horrific enough, as if it wasn't bad enough to see the Messiah slaughtered and publicly humiliated and tortured and put to death, as if that wasn't bad enough it was all the more tragic to find that he was there pretty much alone. All of the people that he had affected, ministered to, had all fled. It's sad to know that even from his closest friends, his 12 apostles, one of them would actually turn him in and betray him. Another one would actually deny even knowing him. And all of the others fled in fear. The Bible talks about one disciple whom Jesus loved that did show up at this tragic time in history. Tradition says that that was the Apostle John. Those who have heard me in the past raise serious doubts that that disciple was in fact the Apostle John. I don't believe that it was and today is not the day to expound on that. But suffice it to know that all of the apostles, all of the people that he had such an influence on would leave him in this hour of agony. What we do know is that there were women at the cross. Now, it's a very interesting verse because there's a question of how many women were there at the cross that are named in this verse. Some see three women, some see four women. And it's a trivial point, but if we look at it, we know that one of those women was his mother. We also know very clearly that another woman was Mary Madeline. The blurriness comes in that middle clause there, and depending on where you put the comma, it's a question about whether or not we're talking about one woman or two women here. If we read it that this third woman was the sister of the mother named Mary, then that would make three women. And so some people count this as three women there at the cross. I personally see four women at the cross. The reason I say that is because we know that Jesus' mother's name was Mary. And it would seem unlikely that Mary would have a sister named Mary. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would be unlikely. And if that's the case, then what we have here is Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary's sister, and Mary, the wife of Clopas. And Clopas, by the way, is someone we have no idea who he is. And then Mary Madeline. So four women 
appear to be here at the cross. Again, it's sad that where was everybody else? The hundreds, the thousands of people, the people that Jesus worked miracles for, where were they? Where were the 5,000 that he fed? So many people. Where were those who just a week earlier were hailing him as the king of the Jews and the Messiah. None of them are here at this time. But we have these women at the cross. And from those women, we have his mother, a mom, helpless, and unable to do anything to ease the suffering is there nonetheless to offer what she can, her presence. What it must have meant to Jesus in that hour of agony to look down and see his mother standing by him not able to do anything, but having the courage, having the love to just stand by in his worst hour on earth. When we go in the Old Testament, the famous burning bush, we have God revealing himself to Moses and calling him to take that revelation to his people and to his enemies. And he speaks from that burning bush. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Moses, in his conversation with God, says, if you want me to go to your people, I need to know who you are. I'm going to need a name. What do I say when they ask me, who is this God? They're going to want to know, and I'm going to have to have an answer. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, there's been much about that phrase, I am, which translates in Hebrew the name of Yahweh. And the closest that the English translators could come up with it is simply that, I am that I am. I always kind of saw this as I am fill in the blank. I am whatever you need me to be. I am everything that you may possibly need. And this here was important because in a world that was full of gods, false gods that were worshiped, there was a common thread and characteristic to the gods. For instance, one of the most famous gods is that of the god of Baal who's not a very impressive looking God, but Baal was the God of the storm. He was one of many gods. And in fact, he was not even the chief God. He was not even the main God, but he was an important God to some people. 
And he was the God of the storm. And what that means is that unless you're in need of some rain, Baal can't do a whole lot for you. His domain is that of the sky and the storm. And that's it. The Egyptians, who also had hundreds of gods, one of them was Anubis. And he was the god of the dead. But that's all he was the god of. And so he had his particular territory. The Greeks and the Romans had their gods, and one of them was Zeus, and the Roman Jupiter. He was known as the king of the gods. But yet, even still, with that title, he was very limited. And it didn't stop the other gods from doing what they chose to do. When God is with Moses and he says, I am that I am, I think what God is saying here is, you can't put me in a box. You can't put limitations on me. Don't try to come up with a title that speaks to me. I'm too big for any one title. I'm too big for any one name. And that's the God that we have. And so while, for instance, Baal may have been the God of the storm, Jesus would rebuke the storm and say, peace be still. While Anubis was the God of the dead, Jesus would stand over the grave of Lazarus and proclaim himself the resurrection and the life. And while Zeus may have been known as the king of the gods, we serve a god who bears the title the king of kings and the lord of lords. Is anyone excited about this but me? God cannot be, will not be put in a box. So how do we talk about the God that we serve? One of the common ways that we talk about God and communicate God is through the use of types. And that's a theological concept. When we think of types, think of the old typewriters. A typewriter is, was, a mechanism that would replicate letters, fonts. Another similar concept is that of a pattern. The ladies know that you cut out a pattern and you end up with a replica of that pattern. In the secular world, we talk about metaphors, figures of speech. And if you really want to get theological, there's another word called anthropomorphics. Now, you don't have to know that. But when you go home today and you want to sound real smart to your friends, <laughs> tell them, what did we learn in church today? You can tell them we talked about anthropomorphics. It's a theological word. It comes from two Greek words, anthro, which means man or human, and morphics, or morph, which means change or form or shapes. Anthropomorphics are human terms used to describe something not human. And so we have verses of scripture, the hand of the Lord was upon me. He's using a human concept to explain something not human. 
So when we talk about the hand of the Lord is upon me, wasn't talking about any kind of a physical weight pressing him, but rather was talking about the movement, the influence of God in his life. Verses like the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, using human familiarities of eyes to explain the all-knowing power of God. And so the scripture is full of these types and anthropomorphics. And there are complete studies on an numerous amount of these types. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament tabernacle was a type of Christ. And all of the instruments and furnishings in the tabernacle were types. Simply put, the tabernacle was the place where God and man met. It was the place where man came into to commune and meet God. Jesus is the place where we come into to meet God. He is our tabernacle. Noah's ark is a type of Christ because only those who made their way into the ark escaped judgment. And what saved them was not how good they were. What saved them was simply that they got into the ark. Jesus is our ark of salvation. When we come into Christ, we are saved from judgment. So these are metaphors, figures of speech, types that help us understand who God is. Now the important thing about types is a type is something that is and is not. Now that doesn't imply a contradiction. What it implies is that types are limited comparisons. Because God is so big, no one type could do him justice. No one type could explain everything there is about our God. And that's why we needed so many types because each type would speak to a specific aspect to God. And so some types are rather bizarre and confusing. For instance, we have the brass serpent lifted up in the wilderness. Now every Bible student knows that the serpent was an emblem for the devil. It was a symbol of evil. All through the scripture, and in fact, the scriptures even say, in Revelation, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. And yet we see very clearly, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Here in this one instance, and only in this one instance, Jesus compares himself to the serpent. Why would he do that when clearly it was always a symbol of evil? Well, it all becomes clear when we understand what Jesus did for us. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. So there's no contradiction here because when Jesus was on the cross, he became my evil. He became your sin. Hallelujah. And because he was willing to become sin 
we now can rejoice to be the children of God. Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. Here the symbol is a sheep and says that Jesus is that lamb. But now we also were called sheep. But when it talks about us being sheep, he says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. So Jesus is a lamb, and we are sheep, but in two very different ways. We're like sheep in our rebellion. We are like sheep in our helplessness without a shepherd. Jesus is like a lamb as the perfect sacrifice. So types are limited comparisons. He is also noted as the high priest. Here it says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of your heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. This is an interesting verse because this verse also calls Jesus an apostle. But the point that we're making here is that Jesus is both the sacrificial lamb and at the same time the high priest that offers the lamb. So Jesus is both the perfect sacrifice, and the one who presents the sacrifice. Jesus is the Lamb of God, but he is also the good shepherd of the sheep. So we have these different ways of illustrating certain aspects to our God. And I've come to the understanding and realization that when it comes to trying to talk about the unconditional love that God has for us, I'm forced to look at a mother. Because a mother illustrates an aspect of God that very few other symbols can. A mother demonstrates an aspect of God's love that is rare to find in anything else. We know there's differences between men and women in how they think and how they process things. There's a story that illustrates this difference if you would indulge me, it's the story, one of the episodes of King David. A common story where King David commits adultery and has an illicit affair with the woman. She ends up pregnant and he conspires to have her husband killed by putting him on the front line of the battle increasing his odds to be killed. And sure enough, he was killed in battle. The blood of that man was on King David. King David is harshly rebuked by God by way of Nathan, the prophet. And we pick up the story in 2 Samuel. And now the baby from this illicit affair has fallen sick, and David is crying out for mercy. It says, David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent nights laying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. 
David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they thought while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. They're looking at David mourn for this sick baby. And when the baby dies, he said if he couldn't handle this, he's going to lose it and fall apart when he finds out that the child has died. David noticed that his attendants were whispering amongst themselves. And he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked? Yes, they replied. He is dead. What is David going to do now? What's his reaction going to be? Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. It wasn't anything like what they expected his reaction to be. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. David responded. While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David got over it. Now, I'm not saying that he had no sadness to him, but he certainly responded in a way that was not expected. He got up and he's ready to go on with his life. And the next verse says, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went to her and made love to her and she gave birth to a son and named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. Now let me just take a side note here as a point of interest. It says here in this verse that the Lord loved Solomon. And this may be a little peculiar because it is the only time in the entire Old Testament that we have on record that the Lord ever loved any individual. Now, certainly he did. Certainly he loved many people. He loved Israel. But he never named an individual as loving him. In other words, he worked with Moses. He saw Moses face to face. But we don't have anything on record that says God loved Moses. Now, of course, God did love Moses. Please understand me. But it doesn't say that. He doesn't say he loved Abraham. Abraham was a friend of God, but we don't have anything on record that says God loved Abraham. He had a profound, intimate relationship with King David, but we don't have anything that says he loved David. But we do have the only time in the Old Testament where it says that God ever loved one individual, and that individual was Solomon. And it actually says it twice. If we go to Nehemiah, was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, had sinned? Among many of the nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God. Second time where it states that God loved Solomon. I bring that up because when we get to the New Testament, there is only one man that had ever said that Jesus loved him. 
and it was not the Apostle John. Again, we'll get into that on another day, on an, another occasion, or you can buy my book. <laughs> There's no shame in my game. But let's get back to the subject at hand. King David is in mourning. Now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back? That's David's reaction. But it was not Bathsheba's reaction. She needed comforting. She was not able to get over it as easily as David was. She was not able to snap out of it. And such is the nature of a mother. There is a bond of love that is unmatched by anything else in this world and that of the love of a mother. The Apostle Paul, writing in several letters and on several occasions, adopted a certain type of language. He says here to the Corinthians, even though you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Paul identified himself to the Corinthians as their father in the gospel. It was common for Paul, and we see it in his address to Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. He was a father to Timothy. We read it again in the 18th verse, Timothy, my son. It was a title that he used to Titus. To Titus, my true son in our common faith. It was a title that he used for Onesimus, the runaway slave. It is none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. For Paul to identify himself as a father to so many was very common for him to do. But when it came time to expressing a kind of intimacy, a kind of intense love and concern, he didn't use the type or anthropomorphics of father. Instead, he adopts the concept of a mother. And we find it in Galatians, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Here he doesn't identify himself as their father, but he takes it one step further and says, I'm like a mother to you. I'm going through birth pains for you. Because there are some expressions that fail when they try to illustrate that kind of intense love. And you can only find that expression in the concept of a mother. Jesus used this as he lamented over Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers 
her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus adopts the metaphor, the type of a mother hen, because that would be the only, the best way to express the intense love that he had for Jerusalem. God has himself used this kind of language in speaking to Israel, yet Jerusalem says, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. This is what they were feeling. God's response, never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? And then he puts the topping on, he says, but even if that were possible, I would never forget you. It's so good to know that we have a God that has that kind of love for us. When we think about mothers, when we think about the kind of intense love, that unconditional love, that unfailing love, that's the kind of love that we have in Jesus Christ. When we think about mothers on this Mother's Day, it's good to know that a mom is an illustration of the kind of love that God has for us. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter how bad you have been. You know mom would always be willing to take you back in. There's never anything that you could do that would cause your mom to push you away. When no one else wants anything to do with you, you can always count on mom. When you have let her down, and when you have turned your back on her, and when you have done her wrong, she is still willing to take you in. That's the kind of love that we have in Jesus Christ. And to be in the arms of God, to find ourselves at his mercy, to find ourselves under his love. At this time, on this kind of day, when we celebrate our mothers, we need to think about the kind of love that Jesus Christ has for us. It's an unfailing love. It's an unconditional love. It's a love that will never let you down. It's a love that will always take you in. It's a love that will never get tired of hearing, I'm sorry. Thank God for mothers. Thank God for the love of God. Thank God for the gift of mothers. Thank God for the gift of Jesus Christ. We can, we can build it from the floor.